Uh, but as we get in the Word today, we've been looking at the five purposes of the church. And I want to see if y'all have learned them yet. And so let's try to recite them together. Does anybody know what the first one is? Yes. Yeah. Are they on the board? Okay, good. <laughs> y'all got that so quick, I just wanted to make sure there wasn't a cheat sheet behind me. Worship. Fellowship. Keep going. Okay, I'm going to help y'all because it's easier to follow a voice. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, evangelism, and today we're preaching on ministry. Ministry. And uh, the title of the message is Bloom Where You Are Planted. And I want to begin by reading one simple verse, Acts 17, 26. And the verse says this. It says, and he has made, speaking of God, God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, here we are once again standing in need of a touch from heaven. Standing in need of the voice of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Father, only you know what every individual here uh, needs today, what you want to speak to them today. And I just pray that every heart would be open to receive your word directly from you to them through the scripture that we're going to look at this morning, through the message that's going to be preached this morning. Stir hearts, change lives, impact the people here, inspire us to no end for you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's all kind of ministry needs. We have ministry needs both inside the church and outside the church. For example, inside the church, it might be to care for the widows like we see in Acts chapter 6. And it may be to help with the financial need or it may be to give emotional support to someone who has a loved one that they've lost or, or maybe someone's sick in the hospital. There's a lot of ministry needs inside the church, as you know. But there's also ministry needs outside the church. Listen to Galatians 6 two. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now that's what we do as a body of believers. We bear one another's burdens. That's why our small groups are so important. I mean, if you can only come to one hour of service on Sunday, I would rather you come to the Sunday school hour than the church hour. Because the Sunday school hour is where you are surrounded by other believers that give you the support you need. And we need, remember I told you a few weeks ago when I was preaching on fellowship, there's no long ranger Christians. And you can be a long ranger Christian and sit in a worship service and never fellowship or connect with anyone. Philippians 2 4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. These are ministry verses. Now, we touched on inside the church in week two when we talked about fellowship, as, as I just did now. So, really, today, I want to focus on needs outside of the church because I said there's ministry needs in this, inside the church. I think the church is doing a pretty good job on taking care of ministry inside the church, but the outside of the church, what about the ministry there? Let's look at the community where we're planted, Lenthia Springs, Georgia. Now, myself and the transition team, we've been reviewing demographics about a three-mile ring around our church. And here's something that I think you'll be interested in knowing. Within this three-mile ring, Lithia Springs is a melting pot, 49% African American, 31% white, 15% Hispanic, and 4% other nationalities. That's a melting pot. And the community is slowly growing older, Families with younger children are slowly trending down, very slowly, but I'm just saying that's the trend. When it comes to marital status, singles, separated, and divorced are higher than the state average. So in other words, there's some single parents right around this church. We're talking about inside the three-mile ring. Don't lose sight of that. And married couples are lower than the state average. 
So single, separated, and divorced higher than the state average. Actual married couples, families, complete family units lower than the state average. As of 2021, it's estimated, this, this is going to blow your mind. It blew mine. And it shows us how desperate the needs are outside the church. It is estimated that 73% of our community within three miles of this church has no involvement in church. No involvement. I'm reminded of Jesus' words. You might remember when he met the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And, you know, he had sent his disciples into town to get them some food. Now, it's a whole other message, but just think about this one little fact. As they went in to get food, there was no superhighway. They didn't get in their Subaru. And, and <laughs> that's an inside joke from Sunday school this morning. So you come to Sunday school, you hear things you don't hear in church. Or you hear things in church you don't understand because you weren't in Sunday school. But they didn't get in their Subaru and jump on a, on a street and drive down to Kroger. No, they walk, basically they would walk a footpath from the well to the town. And so it's very clear to me that the disciples going into town to get food had to pass the Samaritan woman that was coming to the well. They had to pass her. But apparently they didn't stop and engage her in any kind of conversation. And she comes and she sits down at the well. She's speaking to Jesus. They have a conversation. He's talking to her about salvation. She comes to realize he's the Savior. And she accepts that. And what does she do? She runs back into town to tell everybody. But here's the thing. While she's sitting there talking to him, the disciples come back from town. And they're going, why is he talking to her? They had passed her. They didn't talk to her. Why is he talking to her? And so she leaves and said, just left her water pot. The in reason she was coming, she didn't even worry about that anymore. She ran back into town. Why? To tell everybody she knew that she had met the Messiah. And so the guys come back and they didn't even ask him what's he doing talking to her. They just said, here's you some food. He's like, I'm not hungry. And they go, did somebody give you something to eat? And he says, you don't understand, do you? And here's what he says to him in that context. He says, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Now, I don't know. It doesn't say it in the Bible, but I like to picture it like this. This woman had went back into town, told everybody the Messiah was at the well. And I believe people come running out of town to see this Messiah at the well. And while he's talking to his disciples and he says, you say that there's still four months and then comes the harvest? And he says, lift up your eyes. He says, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are already white for harvest. And I imagine as they lifted up their eyes, here's all the people streaming from town. How can we get the people of this community to understand the Messiah is here and they need to stream in to meet him? That's our challenge. That's the ministry that we need to do outside of the church. And the title of the message, Bloom Where You're Planted. I'm sure you've all heard that expression. It's a well-known phrase, and it means that you should do the best right where you are. You know, just because our current circumstances and our demographics may not be what we would like for them to be, there's no reason that we should not do our absolute best with where God has planted us. Bloom where you're planted. We must believe that God's ordained us to be here at this moment in time and that he's calling us to bloom here. Listen to Acts 17, 26 again. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth as has determined and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. You're here because God determined you to be here. You live where you live because God determined you to live there. You're in the time of history because God decided you would be in this time in history. This is where we are, folks. We're to bloom where we're planted by God. Bloom where you're planted. And not only that, we're, we're not only to bloom, but what I love about flowers is they have a fragrance, right? We need to be the fragrance of Christ. 
You know, I've, also, I've always been a, a cyclist, and I'm talking about the pedal variety. I've never rode a motorcycle. Well, I've rode a few. Every time I rode one, I wrecked, so I thought, well, I, I don't need a motorcycle. But I've always rode bicycles, and, and I love that. And there's nothing like getting on an old country road. There's a road in between Kennesaw and Cartersville, and, and I was riding it one day. And the thing about getting out in the country like that is you don't have cars, you don't have pollution you don't have all the stuff that all the noises you hear the birds i mean it's a beautiful experience you know and and one day i'm riding this road and and all of a sudden this particularly pungent smell began to hit my nose and it was the smell of some carcass rotting on the side of the road and i'm and you know what it did it did something good for me it caused me to pedal faster I'm like, man, I don't know what that is, but I got to get past it. And I pedaled hard, and, and finally it began to fade away. And just as it fade away, a new smell hit my nose. It was the smell of blooming honeysuckles. You know that smell? And man, that, then, I, then I slowed down. I pedaled slowly, and I, I just breathed that in. We're talking about being a fragrance. And here's the thing, the thought of the smell... And the thought of the fragrance represents everything that we need to be focused on as a church. And I'll share more about that, but 2 Corinthians 2.15, listen to what it says when we're thinking about being the fragrance of Christ. It says this, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We're not only to bloom where we're planted, we're to be the fragrance of Christ where we're planted. So let's talk about the misconception of what church is because some of us have it. Here's the thing, I'll tell you what church is not. Church is not the fulfillment of our faith. Here's what I mean by that. Many see the church as the end-all, be-all for their faith. They show up for an hour or two every week to be fulfilled by their Christian tradition. Here's what they do. They come as the audience. They look at Ty and Barry as the performers. And the end result is for them to feel good about being in church on that Sunday. It's for their spiritual enlightenment, for their encouragement. And it is for enlightenment and encouragement, but if that's the end of your journey, then you're, you've got a misconception about what the church is all about. The mindset is this. It's the mindset of being instead of the mindset of doing. All right? So too many church members are being ministered to in the church, but they're not doing ministry outside of the church. Are you with me? Say amen. Y'all are grunting, and I know why, because this is a hard message. It's like, are you with me? And when everybody goes, uh, it's like, I don't want to be, but I understand what you're preaching. I know. It's, hey, I had to prepare this. Imagine how many times it stepped on my toes. I'm just saying. The mindset of being instead of doing. Listen to this. We will never be the fragrance of Christ in the community until we get out and become Christ in the community. Amen. Churches can't just open their doors and expect people to come in. I mean, our doors are open every week. How are we doing with that? Not great. I don't see people flooding the doors to get into the church to smell the fragrance of Christ because we're blooming where we're planted. Effective congregations go out into the community. Right now, our transition focus team has been tasked to develop action plans for our church designed to create new church growth. The plan is to introduce new initiatives related to the five purposes of the church and prayer. The team will be developing three initiatives for each of these church purposes. 
There are going to be short-term goals, which is something that we can easily do as a church quickly, right away. For Now, I'm talking about prayer. Help me with it. What's the five? <clears throat> Worship, fellowship, discipleship, evangelism, and ministry. So imagine that in a few months, we're going to come before the church and we're going to say, here's the goals that we believe the church should strive for to become the fragrance of Christ and to bloom in this community. Short-term goals, easily done. Then there's going to be a mid-range goal for each one of those. And these are going to be a bit more involved and it might carry over a series of months, but you know, it's kind of mid-range. You can get it done fairly quickly. And then there's going to be long-range goals that may even take up to several years to get God-given results. But this is what we're going to do, is we're going to come with a plan and, and we're going to ask the church, hey, here's the plan, let's, let's all work the plan, let's all bloom, let's all be fragrant for Christ. So I'm sharing this to alert you that ministry is on the way. And so you need to be preparing your heart to do ministry. Because we're meant to do it together. You know, these goals, they're going to cover both inside the church and outside the church. And specifically our three-mile ring. I'm sure there'll be other places we reach out to. And so I just want you to begin praying now as, and asking the Holy Spirit to guide this team. We have a meeting this week. We have a meeting next week. We have many meetings to come. And uh, just be praying when God puts the transition team, transitional focus team on your heart. Just pray and say, Lord, let the Holy Spirit lead them. And let the Holy Spirit show them what you want for this church. And I believe God is definitely going to do that. So we, we talked about the misconception of church. Let's talk about the conception of church for just a minute. Remember the law of first mention has come up in a, in a few of these messages. As we've been uh, reviewing the first mention you know, was important because what we want to do is we want to look at a, some, something that's first mentioned in the Bible. That's when it's the most um, uh, simple, the most real, the most uh, uh, clear message of what that is. And so the first mention of the church is in Acts chapter 2. And I want to read, and we've read this several times through this series, and I want to read it again right now, 42 through 47. Just listen, read along with me. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. So that's something the church did. In the breaking of bread and prayers, they then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now here's what I notice the difference is between that first mention of the church and what I see in many churches today. They were not just being, they were doing. They were doing all kind of things. Look at verse 43 again. It says, many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Verse 44, all who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 45, sold their possessions and good and divided them among all as anyone had need. And then notice the result of their ministry, of their doing. Ministry was good for the church. Verse 47, it says, it begins by saying they were praising God. Listen, when the church does ministry, ministry, their hearts praise God. Because their experience first, that what happens is they experience firsthand the power of God as they're out in the community doing ministry. They see him working and they come in together and they tell the stories and they praise him for it. It says they were praising God and also says that uh, not only was ministry good for the church and the praising of God, but ministry was good for the community. In verse 47, it goes on to say, and having favor with all the people. Now, to me, that's the fragrance of Christ permeating the culture. It's like, oh, that smells good. 
You know, I want that flower. I want to know what's going on there. They, the favor of the people towards the church. And then it also tells us that ministry was good for the gospel. It says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And, and here's, that's the desired result, right? The people being saved. People coming to know the Savior. Just like the woman at the well going and getting everybody in town and they all wanted to come out and meet him. Ministry was good for the church, it was good for the community, and it was good for the gospel. Here's the thing, ministry is the path to church health and to church growth. So we need to get involved in ministry. The more ministry we do, the healthier we become, the more we grow. It's a simple formula, and there's really no way around it. We need to be a church that is doing instead of just being. Now look at the challenge of ministry. You know, the church is not for believers being, and so this becomes a challenge, right? Because it's comfortable. It's easy to be. It's hard to do. So that's the first challenge is that the church is not for believers being. Here's the second challenge. The church is for the believers doing this is the challenge because it's a sacrifice to be the fragrance of Christ. You have to do something for Christ instead of doing all those things you do for yourself. You have to make a sacrifice, so that's a challenge. But here's the thing, the beauty of sacrifice is what gives us that sweet aroma before God when we begin to sacrifice. Listen to Ephesians 5.2. It says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. A sweet-smelling aroma. So as we look at this, here's what I'm saying to you. is that we can get... We can have a good worship service here. We can have good fellowship in this church. We can be good in discipleship and we're gonna get better at discipleship. We got plans for that. But it's those last two, evangelism and ministry. That's what changes people's lives. Those first three is really kind of for the church. That's the inside the church. We need to worship together. We need to fellowship together. We need to educate and train each other in the walk with the Lord. We need all that. But if we're not doing evangelism and ministry outside these walls, then this church is just slowly going to die and there's nothing we can do about it. The only way that growth should come to this church or any church is when we go out and reach people that don't know him. What an opportunity we have. I mean, it's like you could almost put a blindfold on and shoot an arrow anywhere in this three-mile ring and hit somebody that don't go to church. 73%. That's good odds. That's three out of four. I mean, three out of four people that you talk to outside of this church probably has no church home. And so we're trying to make it easy. We're trying to say, hey, take one of these amazing love cards. We, you know, we, we specifically did not want to say, come celebrate Easter. We wanted a message that would speak to someone that has nothing to do with church. We wanted a message that, that speaks to people. And what's so interesting about this message, just saying amazing love. And on the back, we talk about God's amazing love for you. It's just a brief message that says, you know what, whoever you are, God has amazing love for you. Come and learn about it. But, but what was so interesting about this when we was looking at the demographics, one of the things I noticed when we got to the demographics about what people believe about God, I believe it was the, the number one answer was that he was a God that loves. So we even got the message right. I, I didn't look at those demographics until we ordered these cards. But here's the thing, people may not believe in church, they may not believe in Easter, but they believe there's a God that loves them. And so I need every one of you to take about 10 of these and hand them to people in this community. Hand them to people that don't go to church. I'm, I'm telling you, if you take these and give them to your 
loved ones that do go to church or you give them to your neighbors that you know they go to church, you might as well just throw it away. That's not who we made these for. We ordered a thousand. I think this church can hand out a thousand of these in the next two weeks. I'm just going to be honest with you. If I come in next week and there's still stacks this big, I'm going to be so disappointed. And I may preach a message on repentance or something. I, you know, I may get, I'll try not to get them. But I'm just saying, get them now and start handing them out. When you, when you go through a checkout line, hey, can I give you one of these? Here, the best line in the world when you're handing out any kind of track or invite card, you just say, hey, did you get one of these? Because that immediately creates what's called the fear of losing out. FOMO, right? The fear of losing out. And, and when you put it like that, hey, did you get one of these? They go, well, no, I didn't, and I want one. So just do that. Try it. I guarantee it'll work. And you never know what conversation it might strike up between you and them. But here's the thing is that we have to do evangelism. We have to do ministry. We have to do it outside this church. That is going to be the secret sauce to this church growing. And that's what we're going to begin to work towards. So be praying for that now. So it's time to respond. And I want to give you a few questions to wrestle over before they come with the music. Or y'all can come on, but before we sing, here's a few questions. What is the fragrance to the community? What is the fragrance of our church right now? Here's another question. Are we the honeysuckles of Christ in Lenthia Springs? If not, what sacrifices do we need to make to become the fragrance of Christ? And then I want to ask you this personally. What aroma are you giving off? The smell of just being or the fragrance of just doing? Listen, Mm -hmm. think about that story I told you before that stench and then that sweet aroma when we're just being as a believer we're like that dead carcass on the side of the road in Isaiah chapter 3 God was passing judgment on Judah and Jerusalem his children because they had fallen away from God and from what he intended them to be listen to what he says in verse 24 he says and so it shall be Instead of a sweet smell, there will be a stench. I don't know about you, but I don't want that for this church. I don't want this church to be just another dead church on the side of the road that has no fragrance for Christ. And that has to begin in the hearts of every individual believer here. If your heart's not right, if your smell, if you will, is not right, then you're a hindrance instead of a help. This is the period of time that we need to be getting our hearts right with God. And God's been moving and people have been getting their hearts right. And he's preparing our hearts for the ministry to come. This church is going to change. I tell the transition team this pretty much every meeting. There's going to be change. Either we'll begin to grow again or we will die. But we will not stay right where we are today. So is your heart right? Is your heart ready to do ministry? To do whatever it takes to be the fragrance of Christ in this community? To bloom where we're planted? If your heart's not ready for that, you need to come to this altar today and begin to pray your heart, prepare your heart for that. Get on your knees and say, Lord, here I am. You know my heart's not where it needs to be. Change me. It's one of the joys of being here is watching hearts being changed. One or two a week, one or two a week, one or two. So many stories I could tell that I won't. But I'm watching hearts being changed. I'm, all these people that come to the altars every week, God is changing their hearts. We need our hearts prepared for ministry. I hope y'all hear what I'm saying. There's going to be change. It's up to you. It's up to where your heart is. And either the church will die 
or it'll begin to grow again. But it will not stay stagnant where it's at. 